What's going on, everybody? Welcome into a free agency update stream. Uh, normally, we have Blazers Uprise live right about, about now if you haven't subscribed to that channel. That's our second channel link in the description box below. But I figured we'd stream on the main channel because we're in the thick of free agency, except not really because nothing's happening. Uh, <laughs> just had some news that happened that we'll talk about. We just had a, a Kelly Oubre signing. Um, had to sort out Skype and, and whatnot, so that's why uh, we sat on that blank screen for a while. But yeah, um, welcome in. Hope your days are going well. It is a Thursday. This is day four free agency, and the Blazers still have their mid-level exception. And there hasn't been... When was the last time there was a trade, Eric? Um. Well, I mean, there were some sign-in trades. Other than the signing trades, because that's kind of like a free agency, you know, that's a signing. Because, yeah, the Dinwiddie move got mixed yeah. into the Laker move, but I guess it was that or the Boston Tristan Thompson, Jason Richardson. Before free agency. There hasn't yeah. been one single normal trade in free agency, which is very, very weird to me. So we're yeah. going to talk about... How we're feeling about Olshay. We're going to talk about how we're feeling about the offseason. We're going to talk about some of the narratives in the Blazers fan base. We're going to talk about Paul Millsap because he's kind of the hot target for our MLE right now. We'll talk about Kelly Oubre signing with the Hornets. And we can talk about, uh, I don't know, I'm sure there's probably other things that we can talk about. Uh, uh, is there anything on the top of your head? Eric Paschal got traded to the Jazz for a protected second okay, rounder. Okay, that's the one pick. Eric Paschal, <laughs> who's a guy that I didn't really want because he's a horrible, horrible defender and not a good three-point shooter. I saw some Blazer fans mad about him. I didn't really mm -hmm. care to have him. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so anything off the top of your head that you want to talk about? Well, uh, since we weren't, we didn't stream uh, the next day, I guess let's talk about the Snell signing real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, another great signing for the minimum. Uh, if we would have used our mid-level exception, much like we talked about with Cody Zeller on Monday night, I would have been mad. But uh, yeah, I think in the uh, I don't know. I like the three signings we've had for the minimum so far. Uh, it's just frustrating that we haven't done anything else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of where me and you sit at. And a lot of the a lot of the fan base is very frustrated right now. But there's there's two different things here. Uh, there's what we've done so far and what we haven't done, right? And I can understand being frustrated that like, oh, we haven't pulled something off yet. But that doesn't mean like I see people getting frustrated at what we've done because we haven't done stuff. And it's like, why are you frustrated that we signed Cody Zeller on a minimum? Why are you frustrated that we signed Tony Snow on the minimum for minimum deals? Those are really solid moves. And Ben McLemore, he struggled last season. The two seasons prior than that was a 40% three-point shooter, and he's an okay-ish defender. Like, n those three minimum signs and the norm signing, like, all those moves in isolation are good moves. You know, like, uh, they, nobody should be, like, criticizing those because of what we haven't done. Like, it's weird that people don't really separate those two things. Yeah, I agree. So, shout Jackson Bird just... 10 Australian dollar dono. Blazers fans be like, why don't we sign Kawhi? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of, lot of criticism and just I think everybody's kind of worn out at this point because, like, to be honest, this is the longest, like, free agency has mattered since we started streaming. Last year it was like, oh, we got Derek Jones Jr. on our MLE. Now it's just going to be minimum signings. We'll resign, like, we resign Mellow the next day, I think. Yeah. We haven't used our MLE yet. It's almost Friday. It's Friday on the East Coast. <laughs> Don't think we're going to use it tonight. Um, free agency started on Monday. So I think everybody's just kind of getting worn out. And the fact that there's been no trades, um, everything is still hypothetically on the table. It's just like being drawn out in a, in a way that I didn't really expect. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Hal Cooper asked earlier, in case you missed it, uh, Kelly Oubre just signed uh, two years, $26 million with the Hornets. Mm -hmm. But we could only offer him $5.89 million, so I'm sure we offered him that. I'm sure he was hesitant to take those offers. He probably got several teams offering him that much. And he took over twice as much money to go play somewhere else. And he probably mm -hmm. has a bigger role there, too. So, uh, like, this isn't a case of, like... <sighs> Olshay, like, not offering him or messing up or anything like that. It's just we don't have 
mm-hmm. the means to make a move like that. So exactly. ML, MLE is the mid-level exception for those that don't know. If you're over the cap, you have an exception um, to sign one player or you can split it up into several players, but every team gets it that's over the cap. There's just two different ones. Uh, if you're a taxpayer team or you don't want to get hard capped, you have to use the tax mid-level exception, which is about $5.89 million. If you aren't worried about getting hard capped, uh, you can use the full one for nine and a half million. Um, so we're in a position where we could probably get to use the full one if we just make a small trade, but uh, mm. I don't think we can as of right now. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I tweeted tweeted that out right when Ubre signed. I tweeted out, <laughs> "Yeah, this isn't the Blazers not wanting." Because here's the thing: it's like. The Blazers were rumored to be in pursuit of Kelly Oubre and wanting Kelly Oubre. And then all of a sudden, oh, he's finalizing a deal with Charlotte, or he's going to sign with Charlotte. And then I see Blazer fans, like, basically criticizing Olshe by saying, oh, of course the Blazers are interested in him. It's not about interest. It's like it's like if we don't land a player, somehow that means Olshe didn't try or he wasn't interested, and that's the only reason. It's like we don't have thirteen million to spend. We're over the we're over the salary cap. We only have about six million dollars to spend right now. Even if we trade Derek Jones Jr. and opened up the full mid level exception, that's only worth nine point five million. That's not gonna compete with two years, twenty six million dollars in total from the Charlotte Hornets. So he wasn't a guy that we could have realistically gotten. Mm-hmm. Uh so like nobody should be criticizing criticizing us missing out on him. So that's that's the thing is like there's moves where it's like okay maybe we could have gotten that guy maybe the criticism is legit you know maybe we should have pushed harder for that guy and then there's moves like that where it's like there's no criticism for the Blazers front office or the organization because we didn't have the means to make that happen well like Brandon B says no sense of urgency whatsoever look at what the Bulls are doing for Levine which I think is completely overrated (laughs) Olshe is such an effing moron All right, so here's the deal name one target that we could have likely got had we pursued him with urgency that mm-hmm. we missed out on. Uh, from all the reports, uh, we don't know what teams they were, but there was teams that offered Otto Porter Jr. their mid-level exception, and he chose to play for the minimum, right? Yeah. Um, Batum chose to re-sign for the same amount of money that we could have signed him for. Uh, he chose to stay in LA, like he wasn't going to leave likely. Mm-hmm. Um, those were our two main targets, right? Uh, <clears throat> Daniel Tice signed a huge contract with Houston. Um, like these, the dreams of getting Ubre and DeRozan and those guys on the tax mid level exception, those weren't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and they played out. Those guys got way more money than we could have gotten. Um, Kelly Olenek signed for way over 10 million. Um, like, I just don't understand, like, who, who people expected us to sign with that money if we were, had more urgency, or how do we know we just didn't try every single free agent that signed elsewhere? Yeah, and that's kind of where I sit at, too, is, like, what should Neil have done by now that he didn't do? And people say, trade CJ. Well, none of the targets that he could have, that he can trade CJ for, none of the targets that we should want have been traded yet this off season. Mm-hmm. So it's like, A, how do you know he's not trying? Just because it's reported that, oh, he wants to keep CJ doesn't mean that he's not trying. He could be trying to uh, increase his leverage across the league. And I talked about that in the rambling video I dropped <laughs> earlier today. Yeah. Um, like, that could be the case. And also, it's just like, what if teams are waiting to see how free agency plays out, to see how other things play out before they accept a deal? Like, what trade, what CJ trade should we have made that's been done already? The only guy that's been traded that's notable is Russell Westbrook. Mm -hmm. We don't want him. Like, that's the issue I have with things is there hasn't been a guy that signed where it was like, oh, we could have gotten him and we should have gotten him. You know what I mean? There hasn't been a guy that's been traded where it's like, oh, we should have traded CJ for him or we should have gotten him. Right? So I understand the frustration with the lack of activity. And I'm like, I'm sitting here just waiting for something, just hoping to 
something across my notification feed on my phone. Mm-hmm. Adrian Wojnarowski saying the Blazers have traded CJ McCollum for Pascal Siakam. Like I go to bed, I go to sleep. I've gone to sleep the last four days. Like just like oh, I really hope I wake up to this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I get it, and it's a little frustrating having to just kind of wait and just the lack of activity. But I'm not frustrated at the front office because there's really nothing they could have realistically done that they haven't. So that's kind of where I sit at right now. Yeah, and I mean, what team have we talked about since the end of the season that could use CJ the most? Uh, Philadelphia. And what the heck have they done this offseason? <laughs> exactly. They sent Andre Drummond to back up, <laughs> to back up Joel yeah. Embiid. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they got, uh, they, they re-signed Green and... Freaking Corkmaz, right? Freaking, yeah, I, I can't believe I just said his name like that. Furcon freaking Corkmaz. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's like, so they've they've done nothing, right? They still mm-hmm. could use a lead guard. It's not like they traded for Van Vliet or or someone like that, you know, and and left us in the dust, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like New York's big move was to get Evan Fournier, like. <laughs> And then they lucked into they, Kemba Walker. I see people like, oh, they're going out and getting Kemba Walker, and we're doing nothing. Bro, like, A, what, should we go after Kemba Walker? B, he's not going to come here to be the third guard. Like, we shouldn't want him as the third guard, but B, he's not going to come here to be the third guard on a minimum. Like, he's going to go to New York where he could start where he's from. Like, that's another example of a guy that, like, people get frustrated that New York picks him up and gets lucky because OKC buys him out. But it's like, wait, is that the guy you wanted? Is that the guy that would have solved all our problems? You know, we have too many small guards, but... They're frustrated about Kemba Walker signing in New York. I I, I don't understand it. Yeah, Boston hasn't done crap. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like what they've been doing, and they kind of sat out free agency too. They signed what Ennis Cantor is their big signing so far. Um, yeah, when he didn't <laughs> and work he's out for them. back they, and forth. They paid it. They they gave up Desmond Bain to get rid of Cantor, and then they bring him back. Like, <laughs> uh, doesn't make any sense. So. But they still, they traded Kemba. They don't have a point guard, really, like a, a for sure guard that's on the level of their team, what mm-hmm. they should be doing. Um, and so, like, yeah, none of these situations are, in, none of these teams are in a situation where it does us no good to come out and say, yes, we're going to trade CJ. Or we're not going to run it back next year. Like, we have to say that in the media. Like, it, it'd be stupid to do otherwise, in my opinion. Yeah. Shout out Jackson Burgess, another 10 Australian dollar donation. What do you write the Bulls off season so far? I guess we should, uh, uh, I will talk about that after I think, uh, this most recent donation, Love Tricks, $2 dono. I wish we got Ubre. He's so pretty. Who now? Yeah. All the, I saw a tweet, like all the guys that have girlfriends to watch the Blazers are praying that <laughs> we don't sign Kelly Ubre. So I guess this is a win for them. Um, but, uh, thank you for the donations. Let's talk about the Bulls. Okay, because you said you think it's overrated, and I don't disagree with that. Why do you think it's overrated? Um, I just don't like what they're doing primarily with all guards. Uh, yeah. Like, I know DeRozan, you know, oh, he played the four or some last year or whatever, but, like, you have DeRozan, Levine, um, Lonzo Ball, uh, they still have White, um, I think I'm forgetting Caruso. Someone. Caruso, yeah. They drafted like, Desumu, who's yeah. like a NBA ready guy. <laughs> right. And uh I mean Caruso and Desumo don't need the ball, I guess, but most of those other guys like kind of need the ball in their hands to be the most effective they can be. And you can't run all four of them out. So like people who are complaining about the the Blazers running a three guard lineup, I think our three guard lineup is better than any combination of guards they have on their team. So I'm not worried about the Bulls at all. Their front court, they gave up uh, Thaddeus Young in one of those deals, and uh, Sadoransky off their bench uh, is no longer. Um, mm-hmm. They lost Daniel Tice um, in free agency. They don't have really much depth at all behind Vucevic. Uh, he's like their only front court player. So those complaining that we only have Nurkic and Zeller, they only have Vucevic, basically. Yeah, so. and they signed Tony Bradley, who <laughs> right. I wouldn't want as a backup center. I mean, he's okay, but like, yeah, it's, I just don't Take think they, over. I just don't think they have a lot going on. I think they're being kind of overrated. 
Yeah, I agree with that. Um, like what you you're paying Lonzo Ball twenty million dollars a year so he can sit in the corner and play off Vucevic, DeRozan, and Zach Levine. You know what I mean? Like he's a I guess he could be a like a three and D point guard, but normally you don't pay three and D point guards twenty million a year. You know what I'm saying? Like they had they've had a good off season. They'll probably be a playoff team next year. I just don't think they're a second round team in the East. So they're doing all this so they can be a first round exit for two three years and then what, they start another rebuild? Because that's, like, the most likely path that they're on, in my opinion, right? I don't... And I said this about Phoenix, and I was like, I don't think they've increased their chances of winning a championship in the next 5, 10 years because I don't think that team is good enough to contend. And I was wrong on that. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely wrong on that. You know, and I mean, you look at the Hawks, and the Hawks make a run. So, like, hypothetically, Chicago could make a run and be better than we expect, but it's like their pieces don't fit as seamlessly as Phoenix's. Mm -hmm. and they don't have a star in the mold of Trey Young. Zach sure. Levine is nice, and his stats last year look phenomenal, but he's no Trey Young. He can't just make the entire engine go. Mm -hmm. So so that's the thing. Like, yeah, they might be able to make a run, but I don't think it's likely. I think they're a first-round exit next year. And also the two guys they got made no sense for us. So that's the thing. It's like, oh, the Bulls are going it. Like, oh, should we have gone and signed Lonzo Ball for $20 million a year? It mm -hmm. was impossible. DeRozan for twenty million a year, it was impossible. But it's like, why do we need another guard, and why do we need a guy who can't play, doesn't play defense well, and can't shoot threes on the wing? And DeRozan, like neither of those guys, Lonzo or DeRozan, made sense for us and were guys that we needed. So that's kind of the problem I have when people use Chicago as an example of why this offseason has been a complete and utter failure already. Yeah, my thing with the Bulls is. Um... Like, yeah, they they should be a playoff team. I think it's a failure if they don't. But like Trevin mentions, it's a good point. People attach the team that has done the most and makes the most, like, splashy moves, and they always overrate that team. It's like it doesn't necessarily mean they built a good team because they were pretty bad last year mm -hmm. with Levine. So, yeah, he could have a breakout year, but, like, he had a breakout year the previous two years, basically, and that didn't really matter in terms of winning games. So, um yeah, he's got some firepower with him now, but like I said, all, all that firepower needs the ball to be effective, and I think Levine kind of needs the ball to be effective too. And so I, I just don't like adding so many of those types of players to a roster instead of role players, and that's why I think it's always overrated when teams don't think about how the pieces fit. They just try to add as many good players as possible without kind of going for the best overall team they can be. And that's why I agree with you that I don't see a, a super high ceiling for this team. So I feel like it's just kind of throwing money out there to throw money just to like maybe prove a point that you could do it or whatever. But but it doesn't necessarily ever translate to wins for most teams. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm going to post a poll. Um, I'm curious how far you guys think the Chicago <laughs> Bulls will get. But I mean, it's a team that's going for it. You know, I mean, like I understand the want – for the Blazers to upgrade, and I want that too. It's just like when it comes to, like, getting mad because other teams are doing specific moves, like New York signs Kemba Walker after he gets bought out, and the Bulls have the means to go out and get DeRosa, go out and get Lonzo Ball, like, which are guys that we shouldn't want. Like, I don't understand getting frustrated because of that mm -hmm. specifically, so... And uh, Taylor Packer says, I mean, at least they're taking a swing, man. And it's like, okay. I, was, I, I, don't, I don't get the people who are like, oh, just take a swing no matter what. Like, if it's good or bad, just take a swing. <laughs> like, Portland is still a better team than, than Chicago. I don't – I would bet every single dime I had on that, that Portland is a better team right now mm -hmm. than Chicago. But people just are so infatuated with the fact that we've only done – minimal things and <laughs> they do do all these splashy things that um uh yeah i just <clears throat> i i just think it's it's crazy that people like want us to take a risk so what you wanted us to trade for derozan and <laughs> have a different third guard on our team like yeah. that can't shoot you know yeah like it doesn't a make worse defender than norm <laughs> right the thing is i think i looked at something and like norm has an equal standing reach to demar derozan too yeah it's like no i don't know like 
standing reach isn't 100% a thing, but I value standing reach more than I value height. Because, like, I value, like, the, t the top of your head isn't going to affect the basketball play. Right. How high you can reach can, you know, for contesting a shot, blocking a shot, grabbing a rebound, etc. Like, the top of your head isn't doing anything with the, the top of your head ain't getting a rebound. The top of your head is not going to block a shot unless you're, you know, James Harden playing a passing lane. Um, so that's the thing is like saying reach wise, he's low undersized, but like if you just look at height, like, Oh, he's six, three. Yeah, that's bad. Standing reach wise. He's not as undersized, undersized. I tweeted out a list of guys who had shorter standing reaches than him. One of the names was Harrison Barnes, right? But like, if he was our small forward, people wouldn't be say he's hmm. saying he's undersized or anything. And I think Harrison Barnes is a worse defender than than Norman Powell. So that's the thing is height can be misleading. Standing reach matters, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I like. I think we should just have this conversation now. Mm -hmm. I think the issue, though, is like it would be nice to have Norm at the two when I think he can hang with pretty much every three in the league. Right. And then it would be nice to have like a guy like Siakam, who I think can guard one through four very, very well, and you could slot him wherever. And Norm mm -hmm. could slide up and guard the three, or he could stay on the two. Roko can guard the three or the four. It wouldn't be like a LeBron because that's who you put Pascal Siakam on. Uh, Roko could guard like a lesser player and then play more off ball, more help defense, which is what he's best at. So like for that reason, that's why I want like a CJ for Siakam trade, but it's not because Norman Powell was insanely undersized at the three. I think... I think that whole narrative is overblown. He's not quite as undersized there as people think. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so, just to go back real quick, so I don't yeah. think I don't think Chicago, like I don't like have a problem with what they're doing. And yeah. if anything, I mean, I think they're kind of overpaid a little bit for Alonso mm -hmm. and um, and DeRozan. But if there was a market for them, you know, they could always flip one of those guys later on, you know, get some trade assets. But that's the same thing we did with Norm. Like, once he becomes available to trade, that's a good contract that we can mm -hmm. trade if it's determined that it's not working out in the three-guard lineup and CJ has no value. Well, maybe Norm does, mm -hmm. and we can trade Norm out for someone, the missing piece then, or whatever. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be CJ. Um, it sucks that we can't trade Norm till. Uh, January 15th, I believe, since we use bird rights to sign him. Yeah. But, um, but like, <clears throat> we now have some medium range contracts during the season we could trade out. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm hoping there's a big trade. I'm not saying I don't want them to trade anything or whatever. But uh, I, I just, it doesn't make sense um, for us not to be aggressive if we're not going to make a trade if that makes sense. Like, uh, like I, I felt like we would have done, we would have just used our, our MLE by now on the best possible person if we weren't having something else we're waiting on, you know? And that's the feeling I get too. But like, that's the thing is it's gone long enough that I'm right. starting to question my own thought uh, process on things, which is something I rarely do, but it's like, it's gone on so far and we haven't used the MLE yet. Like, it's like something has to be brewing, but I've been more optimistic than other people. And now I'm starting to wonder, like, maybe I'm just too optimistic and we're not going to do anything. Like, that thought has crept into the back of my head. And I'm more for running it back than most people, but I don't want that right. at the same time. You know what I mean? I'm just not going to, like, completely freak out. I'm going to be disappointed and frustrated and probably, like, man, oh, Shay doesn't seem like he's ever going to like trade CJ or make a splash like this is kind of the time to do it uh especially with Siakam on the table but that's the thing at the same time you don't know how much Toronto is asking you don't know if they want Nurkic in two picks like that's the tough part with judging GMs is you don't know a lot of things that go on in trade calls behind mm -hmm. closed doors etc whereas like a coach you can see what's happening out there on the floor on the floor night in night out so it's sort of a situation where I'm just like, I, I don't know. I, I get the, like, it makes sense logically that something's coming and I agree with you, but I'm starting to question if I'm just maybe a little bit too optimistic. Yeah. And, uh, so let me just make my stance be known. Mm -hmm. I want them to make a trade. I think they should make a trade. I think it's crazy if they do not make a trade. 
<laughs> but I kind of also at this point, like the narrative has gone so far the other way that this roster is just absolute trash and absolutely like coaching was not the problem. Like it's all say that's the problem, whatever. I kind of just want them to run it back and show I, I, I'm more confident that Billups is going to be a good coach than I've ever been about anything basketball wise um, in a long time. And uh, I don't have anything to base that on other than I just feel like, I just feel like he gets it as a coach. I just feel like he knows what to do. And uh, so part of me will, will not be pissed off if we run it back because it's an ultimate chance to prove or, uh, you know, show everyone just how bad the coaching was and just how good this roster actually is with the right coaching. And uh, once again, I don't want that to happen. I want them to just trade for Siakam so they have a great team and we don't even have to ever worry about it. And everybody can be happy. <laughs> everyone can be happy or whatever. But... This that's the silver lining to me if they do run it back is at least then we can either say, see, look, look at this. Uh, look at the floor. Look how these guys are playing when they're coached properly and running the right schemes and doing things differently, not just running the worst scheme mm -hmm. ever on defense and not doing anything to change it again. Um, you know, like. Dame's getting double teamed. Oh, what should we do? Oh, let's just keep running pick and roll right into the double team at half court where you can't do anything about it. You know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'd be happy to, to see that at the same time. It gives everyone a chance to, if we suck next year, uh, tell us we're idiots and we don't know what we're talking about, which I'll gladly accept. I mean, if, Cha and... here's a, if Chauncey does all the same things Stotts does, it doesn't mean we were wrong. Yeah, but it means I'm we saying, were wrong on like Chauncey, you I'm, know. But it wasn't mean we were right. wrong on Stotts, you know what I mean? It would turn into like Chauncey's doing all the same stuff, and you cannot do this stuff. And people would probably say, "Oh, you guys just hate every coach." But I mean, like I don't know. I'm not a hundred. I'm very confident in Chauncey. I'm not a hundred percent sure. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't know, but I, I'm confident it'll be better. It's hard to get worse <laughs> than, than it was last season. I'm just saying. Let's say they do do things differently. They run a, a nice offense. Uh, they're still like around the same efficiency wise, yeah. uh, even with better passing and ball movement and all that kind of stuff. And then like they run a bunch of stuff on defense, but they're just the roster so bad and the three guard lineup can never get better than the 29th defense because no matter what we do, it just sucks. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's say that happens. Like Chauncey's trying all these traps and new schemes and all this stuff. It doesn't work. I will gladly sit here and say I was wrong. Like this roster sucks. But I don't believe that. And I, you guys know I've always been higher on the roster than more people, most people. Once again, I'm not saying I want to run it back. I want to improve the roster. It should always get better every year mm -hmm. instead of like just, oh, we can do better next year. We should beat Denver next year. Like that shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be to get yeah. further and stuff. But I still believe under the right coach, if we are have a season like Utah or Phoenix did last year, where all of a sudden we're surprising people and up near the first or second seed, one of the players on our team other than Dame would be an all-star too, and then everyone would be like, oh, look, we have two all-stars now, and um, like, look at all this stuff. Like, We can, we can contend maybe and all this stuff. Um, so like, the talent difference that people think is, is there right now is, wouldn't be there necessarily <laughs> in people's minds if we just had a better season, but... I don't know. I, I don't want to run it back, but like part of me would be okay with it just for those reasons. Yeah. See, and you'll say that, but there will still be people in chat like, you I can't believe you want to run it back, right. even though you literally just said five times you don't want to run it back. Yeah. And like, that's kind of where I am. I think I'm, I think I'm like, I, I agree with all that. And I'm, and I, my thought process is along those lines, but I think I'm a, maybe a little bit more against running it back than you are. Yeah. Like I would be, I would be pretty frustrated and I didn't think I'd feel that way. I've kind of changed my mind on it a little bit. Yeah. And it's kind of because I just think like at some point Olshay has to make something happen. 
And we can sit here and be like, oh, well, Toronto wanted too much. We weren't in a good position. But at what point is are the excuses going to stop? You know what I mean? Like, at some point, he has to make something happen. And he hasn't made a big splash happen. Like, maybe Norman Powell's a big splash. Mm-hmm. But it's not like getting like a... Like, I wouldn't say Norman Powell was an all-star caliber player. Right. Like, he was a very good starter, but not an all-star caliber player. So it's kind of a situation where it's like... Are, at some point, he has to make a splash for an all-star caliber player, in my opinion. Yeah. And maybe Chauncey is a is a you know just a phenomenal coach, and you know like I'm not saying that CJ can't be an all-star or isn't an all-star caliber player. I'm not saying Nurkic is, but like we need like Nurkic could potentially be that. But I just think we need that piece. We need like a Siakam. I think a CJ for a Siakam trade would make us contenders because it, it kind of comes back to like. If Chauncey's a good coach, and this is a question for you, if Chauncey's a good coach, like a really good defensive coach, mm-hmm. what is the ceiling for our defense in terms of where it's ranked in the NBA? Um, I think you can get by with okay players if you have an excellent coach and scheme to be in that like 10 to 15 range. Yeah, but that's like the ceiling. I'm and just I saying, agree. like, yeah. If if like the roster is terrible and you, but I I still don't. Believe I'm just saying with this roster, like that. if we run it back, like let's let's just say we sign Millsap, okay. and that's our lineup next year. Yeah. Well, I think we have a higher ceiling than 10 to 15, but 10 to 15 would be my expectation. Because, I think our ceiling would be 10 to 15. Yeah. The reason why I don't say our ceiling is that is because, um, well, for one, Zeller is a little better defender than Cantor. Um, and two, we have the potential of Nas and Simons improving defensively, uh, taking another huge step. We saw Ant take a huge step this year. Uh, hopefully Nas takes uh, an even bigger step in his defense. Like we've seen flashes, but he hasn't really had the right role for him defensively yet. So if those two players are utilized correctly in our bench defense with uh, Tony Snell now is a little more locked in. Um, we have Derek Jones still is on the roster. Um, I feel like we have the wing defenders to play a better style. So if those, if Ant and Nas step up their defense even more and become plus defenders versus, uh, you know, the negative defenders they've been in seasons past, I think this team can move forward um, into that sneak into the top 10. But yeah, I, I agree. It's not going to be like number one or anything, but yeah, I think the ceiling is like 11th, 12th. Like, but, I don't think the ceiling is top 10. That's if, go ahead. Good. Well, I'm just going to say like, that's, that's the issue with me is I just, I look at this roster and, like, it should be a lot better defensively. That's why I think Stotts was a huge issue. But I'm sort of coming around to the thought, like, do we really have a ceiling that is within the top 10 defensively with this roster if Chauncey's a really good defensive coach? I'm not sure. Like, I think the ceiling is, like, 11th or 12th. And I feel like contending teams, they might not end up being top 10 on both sides of the court, but, like, their ceiling, you'd look at the roster and you would think, okay, their ceiling is top 10 on both sides of the court. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, it's it's hard to find a contender where it's like their ceiling isn't top 10 on one side of the court. And maybe people will say Brooklyn, but they also have like three superstars, you know, like unless it's a situation like that, that's kind of an outlier. So I look at it, it's like we have, I mean, how many guys do we have on the roster that we would say they are top 25% defenders at their position, top 20 to 25% that would be in our rotation next year. If we sign Millsap, we got Zeller back up five, Ant Nas off the bench, and then mm-hmm. the same starting lineup as we did last year. I would say there's probably only one guy that we know is going to be a top 20 to 25% defender. I think Nurkic can be two, but I have a hard time, like, considering Dame and CJ are not good defenders. I think CJ was better last year than some people expect, but they're not good. I think they can be better, but, like, there's only one guy on this roster that I feel like is a top quarter defender at their position and then you have Damon CJ and you know like 
I think Norm is fine at the three, so it's not based off of that. I just looking at the roster, I don't know that their ceiling is top ten defensively, and that's kind of have the pro- that's kind of the problem that I have with it. If we trade CJ for Siakam, I think our ceiling defensively is like third to fifth. Mm-hmm. So that's why I want that trade. I just I don't know if this team has enough defensive upside, even if Chauncey's a great coach. Yeah, that's totally fair. I just think let's say we're thirteenth right in defense. If we're top three in offense like we were last year or whatever, um, and you combine that with 13th on defense instead of 29th, I think that's enough of improvement to be, like I said, talked about with the Utahs and Phoenixes of last year. I think that would be, I don't think we necessarily have to be an elite defense. Obviously, we know that most teams that win a title have to be top 10 in defense or whatever. It's very rare that there's outliers. Um but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's projecting this lineup to also win a championship either next year if we run it back. So, but I, I think they could be in the top half of the Western Conference with a thirteenth ranked defense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so somebody brought up it was Adam was up. Adam Smith brings up Tobias Harris. Like, if we went out and traded CJ for Tobias Harris, I think our defensive ceiling would be like seventh eighth. Just because you'd have Norm at the two, you'd have more yeah. size. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily that Tobias is a... I think Tobias is a slightly better defender than CJ. He's not a great defender. He's slightly better, but just positionally, it makes more sense. So that's why it's like, even a CJ for Tobias trade at this point, mm-hmm. I'd be on board with. Even though, like, I talked I talked to Romp. I streamed five hours after the free agency <laughs> streak. So I'm absolutely crazy. I'd stream 12 hours on Monday. Yep. But I talked to Romp and... What's up, Romp? He's yeah, a, what's up, Rom? Rom's the Rom's a legend, 76ers fan. Um a rational 76ers fan. <laughs> he rants about his fan base, much like we do, Eric. Yeah. Uh but like, I don't know, like offensively he kind of made me a little bit more eh on Tobias Harris, but I would still do that trade. <laughs> yeah. Trevin says CJ for Tobias caps our ceiling. I don't do you know. Think we I mean, have a we don't have a lower ceiling. I don't think we have a lower ceiling. I mean, we could always honestly we trade for Tobias. We could still do all those if we don't give up assets for it. If it's just a straight swap, mm-hmm. um, we could still try to get a Siakam at the deadline or someone with Tobias. You know, you could just attach picks to him if it's not working out or. You know, it's. I think he'd have as much value as CJ in most trades at that point. So, uh, yeah. I don't so, think I don't think it necessarily precludes us from doing something else with it. Yeah. So I just I just want to respond to this, Chris Clinton. Norm at small forward against who? Are you kidding? Like this kind of whole narrative about Norm Powell at the small forward position. And let me just. I found it. Let me just read this off. Here are players that have a standing of reach within an inch of Norman Powell's: Cam Johnson, Miles Bridges, Rodney Hood. McDermott, Paschal, Kevin Porter Jr., Tobias Harris. His standing reach is only one inch taller than Norman Powell's. We're talking about getting him. He's like a 3-4, right? Evan Fournier, Gordon Hayward. Here are players with an equal or shorter an equal or shorter standing reach. So these guys have a standing reach equal or shorter to Norman Powell's. DeMar DeRozan, Jalen Brown, Kelly Oubre... Jake Lehman, Karis LeVert, Dorian Finney-Smith, DeAndre Bembry, Stanley Johnson, Brandon Clark, Dylan Brooks, Harrison Barnes, Joe Harris, Jimmy Butler. But, like, Jimmy Butler at the three, you know, you're not complaining there, right? Even though he has a shorter standing reach, which I think is more important than height. Mm -hmm. So that's my response to that. Yep. Like, I agree that Norman Powell's better at the two. I just... I don't know. I, I feel like the whole narrative, like, he doesn't have a chance. He's screwed at the three. It's horrible. Like, it is a little bit too much. And, I mean, Michael Porter Jr. killed this last, in the playoffs, a few, at a few, I mean, he really went off a few quarters, right? But for the most part, it was their guards <laughs> making big shots down the stretches of games. Yep. Like, that wasn't because we had a three guard lineup. That was just because, like, we had horrible backside rotations and we over helped and mm-hmm. let those guys get open shots it had nothing to do with the size of our players yeah even like against a situation, the big team 
Yeah, it'd be like a situation where like Michael Porter Jr. would run off a screen and whoever was guarding him would get caught up on the screen and then the guy guarding the screener wouldn't play up to help and Michael Porter Jr. would get a wide open three. That's not a wide open shot because Norman Powell is six foot three. You know what I mean? Like, so there's a lot to it. But here's the thing. Eric, in game six, Michael Porter Jr. went off during that first half. You know who locked him down in the second half? Damian Lillard. Mm-hmm. Damian Lillard took the challenge of guarding him and stuck to him like a glove. And I was sitting there, like, almost courtside. It's not flex or anything. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I was sitting there close, and I was watching that the whole second half. I was watching how Dame was guarding him. Mm-hmm. Dame was doing a great job. So, I mean, I, it's not something that you would have success with if you did it constantly during a series. Like, you need to be able to put, you know, bigger, better defenders on him. There's just so much that goes into guarding a guy like that. It's not just the height of the guy guarding him. Mm-hmm. So... Let me think. Yeah, a couple donations. Yeah. Tay plays two dollar dono. Appreciate it. Is Grant comparable to Siakam? Eric, I'll let you answer that. Um, only in terms of if we traded for Jeremy Grant or we traded for Siakam, I think the optics of it would look the same. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. like just on paper, like oh look, we got Jeremy Grant. Uh, he's a great player, you know, and we got Siakam. He's a great player. Um, I think either of those would show that we actually like we're trying to improve the team, whatever. But in terms of actual like stats and analytics and stuff, I don't think it's close. I think Siakam's a much better player. Uh, Grant, um, he showed me a lot last year with uh, I didn't think he could ever be the type of player to uh you know score you know 24 points a game or i think it dropped a little bit towards the end but at one point he was averaging like 24 points per game on decent efficiency and stuff as the number one option on that team so Mm -hmm. he did show me some stuff last year but his defense i think is is pretty overrated um i i think in the right system he would be fine and and it would be above average but i don't think um He's like a lockdown defender like Siakam is. Yeah, I think Siakam is the better ball handler, the better slasher, the better defender, the better playmaker. Siakam's a way better passer, too, yeah. Yeah, so Grant's Grant, three-point Grant's shooting shooter, is better. Yeah, yep. yeah. That's kind of the difference between them. I'd rather have Siakam for sure. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't mind Grant either. Either one would be fine, with my opinion. I think that's an upgrade yeah. if we get either one. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Shout Neil Olshay for a two Australian dollar donation. He Neil says, I'm not trading in Australia? S- yeah, apparently. He says, uh, I'm not trading CJ Bozos. <laughs> uh, he's vacationing in Hawaii, man. Somewhere someone is, is watching this and pissed off mm, at Neil Olshay right now. So, appreciate the dono, Neil Olshay. You should hire, him, hire me as assistant GM, so I'll feed you trade ideas all day. Maybe we can get the ball rolling on something, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But... Oh, let me just say something. So, to all those people who... When I was saying earlier, you know, about the run it back thing. Mm-hmm. And I saw, like, several people in comments. Sorry, I don't remember everyone who said it, but it was multiple people. Uh, but, well, Dame said he needs the roster to improve if he wants to stay or whatever, right? Yeah. Um, I still don't get why people just gloss over the first part of that answer. <laughs> and that was that Dame said, I look around the league, I see teams that change their coaches, and they instantly became way better. And they we have teams, he didn't mention it specifically, but teams that made the playoffs or or – you know, we had Atlanta go to the West Eastern Conference Finals when they were below 500 with their old coach, um, and he was he was started to, to elaborate on that, and then he said, "But I also think we need to improve the roster as well." Like it was it was all part of the same answer. He didn't say, "Oh, it's not just about the coach. We need to improve the roster, or I'm gone." Like mm-hmm. that's not what he said, and it's it's uh, <laughs> um, it it's just it's become this narrative that. Dame demanded we do some something drastic or he's going to request a trade when that's not what he said. Um, and he didn't specify how he wanted the roster to change or whatever. But for everyone who is saying that, how do you know that Dame, let's say Philly called and was like, you know what? 
We massively overvalued Ben Simmons. We will trade you Ben Simmons for CJ. How do we know Dame's like, hell no, I don't want to play with that guy. Like, how do we know that's not what Dame said? And in that case, Mm -hmm. that's Damian Lillard. I mean, Neil Olshay would go to Dame and say, hey, I have this trade on the table, Ben Simmons for CJ. What do you think? If Dame's like, hell no, that's not on Olshay for not making that trade or not improving the roster or not doing anything. And, uh, like, if Dame wants to play with Draymond Green and we call Golden State and they're like, no, sorry, we're not trading Golden, we're not trading Draymond for any price. Like, you can give us, like, 18 draft picks and, um, like, the, like, whatever, every player on your roster other than Dame, we're not trading Draymond. Like, we're going to run it back with him. Mm hmm. Like, what are we supposed to do? Like, oh, Dame's, like, Dame's going to leave because we can't get Draymond Green. Like, I mean, he understands he would be there knowing that we tried to get him and Golden State refused to trade him. Now, if Draymond gets traded to, like, Milwaukee or something for, like, a bunch of crap and first-round picks, uh, then, then yeah, freaking be yeah. all over him. But, like... Like you mentioned at the top of this show, we haven't done any trades. There's not been any trades around the league that have been like, oh, man, if we would have just offered CJ and two picks, we could have gotten that guy instead. And, you know, there's mm-hmm. none of that's happened so far. Exactly. So, like, I don't know. I don't understand how we can just sit here and say what we're doing is going to piss off Dame and he's going to want to leave when Dame is likely been – somewhat involved or had a decision in some of this process too, just like he has been for not trading CJ up until now. And I, I think that part gets overlooked a lot is that it's not just, it's just, it's not just Neil that is in love with CJ or wants to keep CJ. The owner is and Dame Dame has been until this point. And for all we know, I mean, we love Siakam, but maybe Dame would rather play with CJ than Siakam, or maybe like Dame's like, I I don't want to I don't want to spend a part of the year with an injured player, or whatever. You know, I I don't know what it is, but we don't know, and that's the problem. Like people just assume like, oh, Olshay doesn't want to trade him, but like you think if Neil got offered Siakam for CJ and went to Dame and was like, hey, we have this trade on the table, uh, should we make it? And Dame's like, yeah, do it. And then Neil's like, yeah, I like CJ too much. I'm not going to trade my guy. Like, do you think do you think that would happen? Like, I, I, I think you're crazy if you think that's what's going on behind the scenes, in my opinion. Yeah, and I mean, like, that's the thing is, like, there's a lot of assumptions going around. I mean, I don't know. That's why I'm just in wait-and-see mode. There's, you, you, everybody will have, like, two whole months to be worked up before the season starts. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to start getting worked up now. I'm, like, stressing because I'm just waiting and waiting and waiting, and it feels like something's coming, and I'm kind of in my own head, like, am I being too optimistic or is something actually coming? Because it seems like something should be coming. I mean, we we signed two perimeter players, like two shooting guard small forward types, which didn't make a ton of sense unless we're going to trade CJ, in my opinion. So, like, I don't know. Like, I'm thinking about that, but I'm not going to get pissed off yet. <laughs> like, I yeah. just... I'm not buying that. And you guys know I'll get pissed off at Neil Olshay, at least if you watched the free agency stream last year or have seen that clip rolling around of me getting pissed off about us signing Derek Jones Jr. and throwing my hat. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not a situation where I won't get pissed off at him. Like, I'm not necessarily pro Olshay. I'm, I feel like I'm pretty much in the middle at this point, and I'm just going to wait and see. Um and yeah, go back and watch our trade deadline show and the post game <laughs> show after the Spurs game that night of the season with Hassan Whiteside if you want to see me absolutely rail on Neil Olshay. <laughs> yeah, and it's just funny because it's like I was you guys yelling. <laughs> It's like you guys are always so negative. And now it's like we're not negative enough, you know, and it's like you guys are always so negative. Why you gotta be so negative? And now somehow we're Olshay burners because we're not screaming and yelling at him every chance we get. I don't get it. But shout out Jackson Burgess. 10 Australian dollar dono says, screw you, Neil, sign me. I mean, if Neil gets fired, me. we're applying, right, Eric? Co-GMs? Yeah, I mean, I'll be your assistant GM. I don't care. Okay, I'll apply for, for head GM. Um, <laughs> that would be that would be fun. You guys could feed us trade ideas and know that we're trying. I'll, I'll do trade calls on stream. No, those wouldn't, <laughs> that wouldn't go over too well with other GMs. But uh, shout out, Jero, $10 dono says, I hope you... Two are doing well. If the you Blazers well, can't, yeah, 
Uh, appreciated, bro. If the Blazers can't get Siakam on a fair deal, we should sign Millsap and a good third string center and just run it back with CJ. Stott screwed us. Billups is better. Appreciate the donation. And this actually leads into a point I want to make. What were the three biggest things that you could look at to improve heading this offseason? One was like trade CJ for a forward to Siakam or whatever. The other two were the coach as well as the mellow canner pairing off the bench. If the mellow canner pairing turns into Millsap and Zeller, that's an improvement. And the roster is better for that. I know it's not the improvement that everybody wants. I know it's marginal right. improvement instead of uh, big time improvement. And that's not good enough for some people. And honestly, that's probably not good enough for me. But it's still an improvement and you have to acknowledge that. Like, I mean, th we lost a game or two in the playoffs against Denver, even with what I thought was a very bad, poorly coached team. There was a couple games where we lost simply because we're subbing in Mello and Canner together. And then in like five minutes, we get outscored by 15 points. You know what I mean? Like you, you replace those minutes with a Millsap and a Zeller. We're not getting outscored by 15 points, especially if Nas has a breakout season, which is very possible in my opinion. And Anthony should be better. So I think the bench... If we sign Millsap, I know it's not, like, splashy, but it's definitely an improvement. And it, there were so many times last year where, like, Dame would come out of the game and we'd be screwed. And I don't think that'll be the case next year if we're able to land Millsap, which we can talk a little bit more about mm -hmm. uh, in the future uh, or later on in the stream. So that's the thing is, like, two of the three problems I think they are actively fixing. Hopefully, they're actively trying to find a good trade for CJ because then they're knocking it out of the park, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing about the three minimum signings. And if we do land a Millsap or whatever, um, like this is good, uh, like depth. If we do trade several players out, <laughs> um, for one player, we're going to need some, some role players and things to fill around. If we add a star, you have to have good role players. And I feel like, um, you know, we signed uh, Zeller, who's a competent center. He can pass a little bit. He can pretty much fit in most offenses uh, defensively. He's a little weak, you know, inside defensively. Uh, but he's not, like, uh, terrible as, like, a help defender. He's got a pretty, pretty good uh, feel for the game defensively, like in rotations and things like that. So... Um, like good enough to where he can be passable, whereas uh, a lot better than Cantor, in my opinion. And then <clears throat> if you had a Millsap who was, I mean, yeah, last year you can say he fell off or whatever. Maybe it was just the weirdness of the season, uh, all the injuries that happened on Denver and just kind of, I mean, I'll, there was a lot of players that had weird seasons last year. Uh, but <clears throat> he is aging, so it was more than likely – him aging but just a year ago in the bubble this guy was the best defender in the league uh the season prior defending anthony davis and that is a good skill to have on any team right mm -hmm. uh, he didn't just become like the worst defender ever after he was one of the better defenders on a guy like that the year before so that guy still knows how to play the game and i said this a lot during the season i feel like we need to pair Dame with smarter players and like a Millsap, a Zeller, um, those mm -hmm. kind of players. Uh, Tony Snell just understands his role. He's not going to do anything stupid. He's not going to come in and think he's Michael Jordan like <laughs> Kent Bazemore did two years ago, right? Glad so, you dropped the Bazemore in there because that's exactly what I was thinking. Right. So like, yeah, Bazemore would just come in and try to take it coast to coast and he was like shooting 20% on lay-ins at one point mm -hmm. and just like completely ruined our offense, right? And Snell's not going to do that. He knows where to be. He knows, and that's the other thing. Snell's not like the greatest, uh, like one-on-one -on -one individual defender. But within the concept of a team defense, he's a really good help defender. Really smart guy. Uh, knows where to be. Knows how to position himself. All that kind of stuff to make plays. So we have all these guys now that can do that. And then you add a Mclemore who at worst, is, like, a decent shooter. And he was hurt most of last year. So the last two, like, full seasons he played, he was a lights-out three-point shooter. So you add just some shooting on the bench, and I don't even know if he'll play that much, but at least you have a shooter there. So, like, I, I feel like we're making moves to improve the overall 
IQ of the team. Now, Mm -hmm. it's not like the big move we need, but you make all these moves and then make a big move, and all of a sudden, not only did you make a a move and get a star next to Dame or a, a player that can help him take that next level, but now you have all these good role players too. So I like what they're doing so far. Just got to follow it up with that next move. And I'm I'm still going to be patient until it becomes obvious that it's not going to happen. But yeah, I like yeah. you. It, the longer it goes on, the harder it is to believe it's still going to happen. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, a Millsap MLE signing and CJ and a pick for Siakam would be an A-plus offseason. In Here's, my opinion, and not an A plus because an A plus would be like Kawhi or like getting Grant too. Right. So it'd be it'd be it'd be an A though. Yeah. It would be an A. It would be the best off season Neil Olshay has ever put together mm-hmm. here. Like, sure. and Chauncey plays a part in that too. Right. So, here's the deal though: if we traded, let's say we traded CJ and DJ and only got back uh, Siakam, yeah, that would open up the full MLE. So you could probably still only give Millsap like five and a half million or whatever, and then mm-hmm. sign someone else to four million, like an Avery Bradley or someone like if you need, if you need an individual defender, like on the perimeter, if that's what you're worried about, I'm not saying it has yeah. to be Avery Bradley, but you could split it up into two people. Cause everyone's saying well, like, there's no one left that's worth the full mid level. So why would you open it up? Well, you could sign two players, you know? Yeah. It's just like, at what point are, I don't know, like we've signed, you know, signing Macklemore and signing Snell, like we're signing a lot of perimeter players. I yeah. don't see, I don't know, like I wouldn't mind Bradley, I guess. It's just kind of like, eh. But here, like here, okay, here's my hope. Here's like my pipe dream right now is, is CJ and DJ to Toronto with a first round pick for Siakam, which I think would be a home run, and I'm not sure Tor- Toronto would consider only giving them up for that. So I'm not saying that they would 100%. I'm just saying this is kind of my, my dream, right? Mm-hmm. CJ, DJ, and a first to Toronto for Siakam, and then we could take on Larry Nance Jr.'s salary and give Cleveland a first. That's kind of my dream right now, and then Larry Nance Jr. is our backup for, and then at that point we wouldn't even have to use our MLE um like maybe then you use the taxpayer on a avery bradley at that point or whatever like we wouldn't need a paul Millsap if you could have a larry nance jr here's the thing with cleveland side note kind of part of this they have four bigs that deserve playing time they have jared allen they just resigned 100 million dollars million dollars over five years they have evan mobley third pick in the draft they have kevin love and they have larry nance jr i think they still might look to trade larry nance jr if they can completely save the money and get a first round pick so that's kind of my like that's the thing is like if well, something is in the works we might be getting a power forward back maybe it's that young from a third team if something's in the works it might be a situation where we're getting our backup four through trade if we're trading cj and dj for like a siakam mm-hmm. and uh yeah i mean for that dream to become a reality uh cleveland at the deadline was said to be asking two lottery picks <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Larry. they would have to not be absurd. Yeah. They would not yeah. have to be like Daryl Morey. <laughs> right. Basically. Um, so hopefully that has come down a little bit. But yeah, uh, Nance or Thad Young, those kind of guys would be mm-hmm. a nice addition to the thing. And you could <laughs> you could actually still sign Millsap too. And, yeah. Because the Siakam's still out two months. but Yeah. Uh, so Habib says they need Nasir and Zach to become who they can be. Zach is a San Antonio spur. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that, but Zach Collins is not a Portland Trailblazer anymore. Um, let me thank the donate donos that have been sitting here uh, for a second. Um, Great. Yeah, Greg Hughes, ten dollar dono says, "I think everyone wants to trade CJ. It makes sense. However, he was the best player on the team last year before injuring his ankle. So, do we let him play then trade, or do we trade him now? Which is a really good point. CJ McCollum had a career year last year." even at the end of the season. Like, he kind of fell off after the injury. He was terrific before the injury, but I think it's more likely that he doesn't have as good of a season next year Mm -hmm. than he did this past season because it was like a career year, right? And if you just kind of look at his whole body of work, like, and average it out, I feel like you should be expecting him to be a little bit worse. So I feel like right now he would hypothetically have more trade value, but also at the same time, he might have more value in the middle of next season because it wouldn't be a situation where GMs are like, oh, they have to trade CJ, so we're going to ask for everything like along with him. You know what I mean? Like, O'Shea might have more leverage. So, 
And if CJ plays better and Olshe has more leverage and CJ has like an even better year, then all of a sudden you're looking at being able to get a lot more back for CJ. So it's kind of a calculated <laughs> guess with multiple things that affect that. And just for the record, it was only a 13 game sam- sample size before he got hurt. So it's not like it was like 40 games or something. Uh, like we've seen him get it hot for stretches before. Mm-hmm. Um, but my worry, so I I kind of agree with that, that, like, I don't think his value could get worse if we did that, if we waited. My worry would be he would play well enough and the team would look so good that it would justify not trading him and then that then we wouldn't look to trade him, like, because that old shit would be like, see where I was right or whatever, and then if it if he sucks in the playoffs again, and then it costs us a series or something. Um, so, yeah, that would be my only worry about waiting is that, uh, yeah, there, he could improve his value. I don't think he could really decrease it that much. But at the same time, it might he might play so well that Olshe doesn't want to trade him or is like, see, I told you it was coaching, and then um, doesn't trade him. But, I mean, I guess if we're, if we're good and it works out, it's fine, but – that's a huge risk uh, to to say that someone who has never wanted to trade him would trade him if he was playing good, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd prefer to just trade him enough for Seahawks yeah. if possible. But, yeah. like, if they're asking for Nurkic and two first, probably not. Probably wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, there, I don't know. There's so many factors, man, that just we don't even know like that's why i have a hard time reacting any sort of way Mm -hmm. before things actually happen and things haven't really happened on the trade market at all so wait and see mode shout out kun marcello 250 i don't know what currency that is is it it rupees i don't i think the rupees was a different symbol i don't know 250 is something appreciate it uh pal can convince spicy p though i mean i would love for (laughs) That, isn't that tampering, though? No, is players can do it. Players can do it. Okay, Pal needs to be in Siakam's ear like, we need to get you to Portland. But, like, I don't know. It seems like Pal and CJ are cool, too. Like, I don't know. Spicy P did post something on Instagram congratulating Norm for getting that bag or whatever. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, I feel like Siakam would would be cool with Portland and the role yeah. he could have here and how good the team is. Unlike could be. Ben Simmons who doesn't <laughs> he hates Portland and Toronto apparently. Bro, we said from the start we're not really interested in Ben Simmons and you had other platforms out here simping for him. Oh, we trade CJ in four first. He's an all world playmaker, defender, extraordinaire. He doesn't even need to shoot ever. He's just so amazing at everything else. And then it comes out, like, the dude, the dude's kind of, this is kind of harsh, but the dude's kind of a tool. The, the, the dude is, like, wants to date IG models and celebrities and play in California, and he's, like, freezing out Embiid, like, won't pick up Embiid's calls, like, is not handling that situation like he should. Like, if he wants to leave, he could answer calling like, yeah, man, sorry, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be here. Uh, I would like a fresh start. Like, tell Embiid that. Don't freeze out his calls and, you know, not pick up the phone. And now it's just he wants to go to a California team. And rumors are he's not really working on his game. He hasn't really improved since he got into the league. And he talks like, I don't know. He's just not the type of guy I would want on my team. Yep. And I don't think it's the type of guy that Dame would want on his team. <clears throat> but everybody else really wanted this guy. And with all his flaws, with how he disappeared in the playoffs, how mentally weak he was in the playoffs, and all these weird... Prima Don is a good word for it, Eric Olsen. All of that, they still wanted him. Like, I... I I don't know. He's not not answer for me. Yeah, I just much like an Aaron Gordon. If you're that athletic and have that much just natural gifted ability, I don't understand how you cannot just be dominant unless you have a poor work ethic, mm-hmm. or just you can have a good work ethic or just not know how to make that 
translate to the basketball court or whatever. So it could be that too. Uh, but like, this is going to sound kind of corny, but I I once dated a girl who <laughs> did, oh like, did ya? Yeah. So we had a Congrats. we had a, a relationship. Uh, you know, lasted a year or whatever, and got to the point where. Every weekend, it was like, hey, let's go do something this weekend. Let's go have fun. Like, that was me telling her, asking her or whatever. And she's like, oh, let's just stay in. Let's, like, like I just want to hang out at home, not do anything mm-hmm. or whatever. So, uh, you know, eventually gets to the point where we break up. And she says, like, well, you never, like, we never go and do anything. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's uh, like, what what the heck? So that's, like, that's, like, going to be, like, sitting there, like, like, Dude, you you melted in the playoffs, and now you're the one not wanting to talk to me. Like I'm trying to like, like get this back to a situation where we can continue to win and like take mm-hmm. that next step, and you're just ignoring me or ghosting me like I'm the problem, you know? Like, um, so I, I feel like he's just that guy who like nothing's his fault. It's just always someone else's, and he's just always going to have an excuse or a blame for someone else. And I don't like having players like that on my team. If I'm yeah. If that's I'm actually, Portland or whatever. But. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good comparison, but you know, chat's just <laughs> I know, they're probably loving that honestly. story. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to <laughs> uh, if only I had if only I had more stories like that, man. <laughs> the electrifying at all amazing Looney Mando two dollar dono. I'm looking forward to seeing Dame, Norm, Derek Jones Jr., Roko, and Nurkic this year. Here's the thing. Even if they trade CJ or even if they don't trade CJ, regardless if they trade CJ or not, there's still a chance Derek Jones Jr. gets traded. I, that could be why they haven't used the mid-level exception yet. Maybe they trade him and save the money to use the full mid-level exception, and maybe they have to give Millsap that. Maybe he has a bunch of taxpayer offers. Or maybe they know they won't have a chance at the mid-level exception. They're trying to sort out a Derek Jones Jr. trade for a backup four where they wouldn't need Millsap. Maybe that's Larry Nance Jr., uh, you know, Derek Jones Jr. and a pick for Larry Nance Jr. I don't know. Like, that's the thing is, it's not all CJ. T- Derek Jones Jr. is the other trade piece we have right now. So, um, I know you're talking about wanting to watch him next year, but he's a guy that could get moved. Yeah. And honestly, even if we do have to trade him, um, I think a if we trade it for Siakam, obviously, like we talked about, he's going to be out for a little bit. So I think that's where a Snell comes into play. He can fit into that starting lineup if we need him to. So if we do have to deal Derek Jones in the same trade, um, we still have a solid enough roster with Dame, Norm, Snell, uh, Rocco, and Nurkic to stay afloat. I think that's a good enough team to keep us in the playoff race until Siakam's back. You're muted. Oh, I am muted. Um, when did I mute myself? I oh, know. I typed. I typed. Uh, I, I try and mute myself. Shout Cole, $2 dono, says, at least I don't have to jump off the bridge now. At least we have all our coals with us, Eric. Mm-hmm. Uh, appreciate <laughs> the dono, Cole. Um, so what are your thoughts on Millsap? We haven't really talked about Millsap. Um, I'd be fine with him. Uh yeah, I mean, I get what everyone's saying about how he fell off last year. Uh, didn't have the greatest playoffs. Um, but like I said, I, I just feel like for some people that was a weird year. But I think within the framework of what we would need him for, I don't think we need him to be that <laughs> that good. We just need someone who knows what the heck they're doing and can – I mean, that guy can still – post up a little bit he can pass he can he's a smart enough defender to uh still help and be in the right positions defensively so once again you add another guy who fits within a scheme very well and you don't really have to worry about being like a negative on that end so i'd be fine with it uh i'm also fine if he signs elsewhere i don't think it's like uh someone we have to have but at this point um he's pretty much one of the best options out of what's left yep he's better than Melo, in my opinion he's a better defensive player than Melo. Mm-hmm. he's a better passer than Melo. he is 
uh, a slightly better rebounder than Melo. Um, yeah, he, yeah, he's a better rebounder than Melo. He's a better finisher inside the arc than Melo. Literally, the only thing Melo is better at is three-point shooting. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. I think if you combined their three-point shooting the past two years, it's like almost identical. Because in 2019-2020, Paul Millsap shot 43.5% from three. Last year, it fell to 34%. So big variation there. And Melo was like 38%, 40%. So like, I don't think it's a situation where like Melo is... Like, Melo's a better three-point shooter. He shot more threes, so that definitely matters. But it's like, that's the only thing Melo has on him. And it's not like Millsap can't hit threes. So, eh, there's a bunch of people like, oh, Millsap. Like, at least we would have a guy that could hold his own defensively at the four. And everybody's saying he declined. What else other than his three-point percentage declined? Because his steal percentage went up. His block percentage went up. His assist percentage went up. His turnover percentage went down. His two-point percentage went up from 50 to 55%. The only thing, like, statistically that declined was his rebounding slightly. Uh, His rebound percentage slightly declined, but not by much at all. And his three-point shooting went from 43.5% to 34, like I said. And his free-throw shooting went from 81.6% to Mm 72.4%. So, like... I don't know, like, and that's the thing is three point percentage or three point shooting usually lasts as you get older. So like, if he can have a bounce back year shooting the three ball, he'll probably decline a little bit with his lateral quickness and whatnot. But he's still quick enough to guard fours, in my opinion, at least off the bench. Like, he'll still be a serviceable player, right? Like, yeah, I don't. I think it's overblown. There's some of the things that are being said about him. So. One reason why I think he had a drop off in percentage is because he got moved to the bench. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he still started 36 games, I guess, last year, but um, especially towards the end of the season, he was coming off the bench once they got Gordon. Um, and uh, I think he was often playing with uh, like the backup center or would be the backup center um, kind of when they played small. And uh, he wasn't getting those nice passes from passes from Jokic. So, and they didn't have Jamal Murray the second half of the season to break down defenses and kick out to shooters either. So, I think that was just a case of um, he was trying to do a little too much in the second uh, mm-hmm. unit and not getting quite as quality of looks um, for the second half of the season. And uh, here, yeah. I have a I have a stat that backs that up. Pre All Star break, he shot forty one percent from three. Post All Star break, he shot twenty six percent from three. There you go. So my eye test was telling me the truth. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't think it's like a case of uh, of him not being able to shoot anymore. I know he didn't. I don't. I forget what he shot in the playoffs, but it wasn't good. But once again, it's like a what ten game sample size, so it's hard to. Yeah, he shot 40% in the second round. Like, against us, he struggled. But, like, his six-game sample size. Against us in 2019, he dominated us. And I know he's getting up there in age, but, like, the dude can still play. And the dude is better than Melo. Like, noticeably better than Melo. Him and Zeller at the 4-5 and is not flashy, but it's so much more calming than... We were... Eric, like... We're kind of removed from it, but just we were playing Carmelo Anthony next to Ennis Cantor at power forward and center. Mm -hmm. And we expected that to work (laughs) in the playoffs. And we, yeah. Remember that game where we were up like seven or nine and then Mm -hmm. we put them both in at the same time. And then all of a sudden we were down like 16 and then we're like... If Stotts does this in the second half, he's he's insane. And then he did it in the second half, and mm-hmm. and we lost. And then and then the next game, it's like if he plays them together, like he's he's completely lost his team. And then what do you see? Oh yeah, first rotation. No, oh, here's here's Nurk and or uh, Cantor and Mello coming in together again. Like mm-hmm. stagger him or something. Like play one and then sit him and then play the other guy. Like do something different. But no, he just kept. 
he was going to go down with that pairing like it wasn't his fault or something. And yeah. Yeah. Just... And I mean, some blame on Olshay too for making that the main backup four and five. You still don't have to play him together. Exactly. You could exactly. take Nurk out a few minutes into the game and rest him a little bit yeah. and have, bring him back with the second oh, unit. Sure. No, no, no. I'm not trying to take any blame off Stoss because that was so ridiculous. I people who say, oh, he had to do that. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm not trying to take blame off of Stoss. I just think like Olshay, and Olshay admitted he made a mistake. Like, go, just go out and get a boring defensive five that can rebound and finish yeah like i don't know like we have enough offense especially if you have mellow at the four you don't need a canner you just need a guy that can protect the rim and rebound and finish inside and that would have been better so like you know that's what i wish he did looking back and i think he realized that too because who do we get cody zeller there you go that's the exact type of center looking back that we probably should have got mm-hmm. and then paul Millsap, you know hopefully is the backup four but i mean I'm not taking any blame off Stotts because it was absolutely ridiculous because he could have staggered them and he could have played somebody else instead of Mello. He didn't, especially since Mello is gone. Like, did we have to play Mello? It's not like we kept him. Um, so it's sort of a situation where, yeah, like, it's not flashy. But with those two come in the game, you're not going to be cringing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're going to be like, okay, well, they, could, they can hold their own defensively. Zeller's, I think he's below average protecting the rim. He's above average everywhere else. I think he rates out to slightly above average defender. And at this point, Millsap, I still think is an above average defender. Having two above average defenders off the bench, especially Millsap, who can still do some things offensively. Mm -hmm. We're talking like we signed Millsap. Hopefully we do. Like, you know, we're just hypothesizing right now. And then if you have Zeller as well, who can pass a little bit, who can finish, who can knock down free throws at a decent clip, like, I'm cool with that. I like that. <laughs> like, especially in Chauncey's offense. So, <laughs> Cash Negro says, you guys are forgetting all the times Melo makes the game so much easier for everyone else. Um, <laughs> okay, so, I mean, we were talking about defensively. But, I mean, I take offense to that because I think out of everyone, I was, like, the most neutral person in town on Melo. I never, like, hated him. <laughs> I never, like, felt like I was just, like, a mellow stand either. Like, I, I feel like, I mean, Tori, you can probably back this up being frustrated with some of the things I said throughout the season about mellow. Yeah, I just came to the realization <laughs> I don't have to deal with mellow stands anymore, bro. Yeah. But, like, I mean, Cash, you know, you've been here for most of the season. Like, you know, I was pretty, pretty neutral on mellow. So, like, I'm not forgetting anything he did. It was just stupid to play him with Ennis Cantor. I was fine with one of them playing. Um, I would have been more fine if it that was Mello instead of Cantor at times because um, he was pretty bad down the stretch. But, like, I, I just I don't get calling me out or both of us out for that because I feel like I was pretty fair. <clears throat> yeah. Eric was too nice to Mello, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I'm glad we don't have to, to worry about that, you know? <laughs> like... I'll take the boor I'll take the boring front court. Um shout out to Cole for this is a different Cole, I think. Two dollar dono says he yeah. stole my line. I started the Cole train. Shout out to that Cole. That was the original Cole. The first shout out to the OG like Cole. The second you should Cole. change your YouTube name to OG Cole. <laughs> uh shout out to Sledman, two dollar dono says play Dame's new track on live copyright is a thing do you want the stream to get taken down because that would be a great and then us not to be able to stream for like a couple weeks because i think that's probably what would happen if maybe, we tried to do that maybe that would be our luck and then there'd be a big trade maybe that's exactly. what we have to do right exactly yeah so no we're not gonna play dame's new track for copyright reasons but appreciate the donations from og cole and sled man and then see our slacker five dollar no no do you think neil tries to sign aldridge to please lillard so he can keep his his guy, a.k.a. CJ. Um, yeah, we should probably talk about Aldridge. <laughs> Aldridge is not a four, and I talked about this in the video. If you haven't watched that video, go watch it. I switched up the camera view, and I know a lot of people probably watch that just to see the different camera view because they think I live in a cave, which I don't, and I proved that today. Um, <laughs> and I said that Aldridge is not a four. He got slower, fours got quicker. He's not a four. He's a five. We signed Cody Zeller. Like, Aldridge probably a little bit better but i mean we probably promised cody zeller the backup center role so if we did that then we can't really sign aldridge 
right? Do yeah, you agree with that? I I completely agree. Uh, this is the problem. One, if it was for a minimum, I guess it's okay. But two, we'll probably use our mid level <laughs> exception on him, right? And then, what happens if he has to retire again in the middle of the season? Exactly. First of all, uh, so you can't depend on him. Um, whereas I think with the two centers we currently have, we need someone who we can for sure count on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's never going to accept third string. That's, I mean, he's it's questionable whether he'd accept being the backup five versus wanting the starting four spot if we signed him. Uh, so I feel like he just has he doesn't have the skill anymore to be that guy that he thinks or we would be bringing him in to be. And I think that's where you run into problems and dangerous Mm -hmm. situations when you have guys who think they're still better than they are, deserve certain roles that they're not suited for anymore. Like you said, playing the four, uh, I think that would be a terrible role. Um, he did accept a bench role in Brooklyn. You're correct. Shervin, but, um, I coming back to the Blazers, I feel like he would think he was doing us a favor by signing with us versus new, like Brooklyn was just like he was just trying to get a ring or whatever, and it was only for a part of a season. But I feel like he would come back and want to uh, have a much larger role than he would deserve, and uh, I think it would kind of mess with the team a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of downside to it, and there's not enough upside. But so. I could definitely see that being a signing and being like, see, I got you help, you know, that kind of thing. Like, mm-hmm. that's what CR Slacker is referring to. So, yeah. Um, but Shaggy Squid mentions Harry Giles. I mean, I'd almost rather sign him or Scal <laughs> to be the 4 or 5. I feel like either of those guys could have more minutes at the 4 if we need someone at the 4 than Aldridge could. So... I'd rather just take a chance with someone with higher upside, in my opinion. And I think that would be better long-term. I'd be down for Harry Giles to be our third-string center. Yeah. Um, He would be better in Chauncey's offense, in my Mm -hmm. opinion, which we still don't know exactly what it's going to sound like, but it's going to be more movement-oriented, which fits uh, Harry Giles better than a stagnant offense. Um, Because we didn't really utilize his passing and whatnot. So I wouldn't mind Harry Giles being our third-string center whatsoever. I would love to bring him back on that. Uh, for that role, yeah, I w- I just want like an athletic center that has still some upside. Like we have two basically proven. Um, I mean, they're fine mobile wise for centers, but they're not like qu- quick jumpers or like gonna be like wow you with super athleticism or something. So, um, and Giles isn't quite the same after the knee injuries, but he still has like potential to be an all around really good player. If you could ever figure it out mentally and with the right coaching, I still feel like he could be a solid rotational center. So I wouldn't mind that at all, but um, yeah, I mean, he's still on science, so it's still a possibility, I guess. Yep. Shout to the OG Cole for $2 dono. He changed his name to the OG Cole. There you go. It says the original. There you go. Um, What else do we have to talk about? Uh, uh so if we, if we lose out on Millsap okay so yeah what if we don't get him <laughs> let me just say this there is still a possibility that there's something bigger brewing and absolutely we talked about this several times we're running out of players to sign and trade for so that's becoming highly unlikely however there is still one Kawhi Leonard who is sitting out there <laughs> No one has heard a word about it. Like, I haven't even seen... Mm-hmm. Before he before free agency started, there was a, a talk about him entertaining offers from other teams, but it's more than likely that he's going back to, to the Clippers. But I haven't heard a single peep about him meeting with the team or, like, what he's thinking or whatever. And I know he's, like, a weird guy. That's possible. But... Let me just say this. If if we somehow do a sign-in trade, it would make sense why we didn't use the, the MLE because 
Yeah. It's pretty much impossible to do it if we use the full tax mid-level exception without sending out a bunch of salary. But CJ and Derek Jones match almost perfectly with what Kawhi would make as a max. And we would have, um, I think, about $6 million to sign, like three guys on minimums, um, maybe even one of those three to slightly more than a minimum. And we'd be hard cap, so we could use, you know, whatever biannual exception or whatever means to to sign that one player to a little more. So I'm not I'm not saying this is likely or going to happen, but if this is the ultimate play here, I mean, it would make sense. Like every everything that has happened so far would make sense if we made that trade. Mm-hmm. But, what if that's Olshay's master play? I I would yeah I would love for everybody hating on Olshay never takes a risk he never does anything and he comes out of this offseason they're all mad because he hasn't done anything and then he comes out of the offseason with Kawhi Leonard yeah obviously extremely unlikely mm-hmm. uh, maybe a one percent chance maybe less right. I don't know like but I mean you have to try I mean Dame Chauncey Norm he's played he's won a championship with Norm I feel like he'd like. Or no, it was been reported that he tried to play with Dame in L.A. with the Clippers. Yeah, yeah for those that don't Chauncey. know, uh, so when when Kawhi told the Clippers he wanted to sign there, but only if they got him a second star, Dame was I don't know if it was the first phone call or not, but Dame was Portland was called and offered a package for Dame to join Kawhi Leonard. In the in LA, um, and the the Thunder took him up on their offer, so he, yeah. he got paired with George. But Dame was a guy that Paul, uh, Kawhi Leonard mm-hmm. wanted to play with, which doesn't surprise me. Dame seems like a Kawhi guy and would mm-hmm. probably be the best teammate that Kawhi has ever had. Mm-hmm. So, right, like he's won a championship with Norm. He's wanted to play with Dame before. Chauncey Billups coached him last year. I don't know how high, you know, how mm-hmm. much. Kawhi enjoyed being coached by Chauncey Billups when Chauncey was an assistant, but maybe that's something you can use. Like, Portland seems to fit him more as a city than some other stars. Like, I mean, you just throw that all at Kawhi and pray, right? And it's still extremely unlikely, but why not? Worst he can say is no. Oh, well, you swung for the fences. I got to respond to this comment, Eric, because this is... Shaggy Squid says, Kawhi isn't the guy to keep Dame from leaving next offseason, he is injured and won't play all season, and then chemistry issues come playoff time like there was for him in Paul George. Um, Paul George is the problem in the playoffs most of the time, not Kawhi. And if you get Dame another top 10 player, and then he doesn't play all season, you really think at the end of next season, instead of playing, staying in Portland and potentially playing with a lineup that has Norman Powell, Kawhi Leonard, Robert Covington, and Yusuf Nurkic, Dame is going to request a trade when all he wants is for us to take a chance at being a contending team and we go out and get Kawhi? Absolutely do not agree with that. What whatsoever, man. That I, I just I don't see how that would mean Dame would leave. Like you get Kawhi and that would make Dame leave. I don't I don't get it. Uh, for the record, Paul George was pretty good in the playoffs most of the games this year. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, Kawhi, okay, so I mentioned this earlier, right? And I did this because I was thinking about about an intern. It's not wasting a year because, uh, like I said, Dave, Norm, Snell, Rocco, Nurk, with a decent bench still. You still could sign some players. If we trade for Kawhi, there might be some players. Uh, like a Paul Millsap, we might get... I mean, we could even maybe sign him for a minimum. Um, mm-hmm. Avery Bradley, like I mentioned, you could maybe get some of those guys to be like, oh, hey, look what they're doing in Portland. Like, I could come in and get some playing time while he's out most of the year, and I could maybe win a championship or whatever. Um, LaMarcus, you know, signing for a minimum whatever. Uh, so... <laughs> I think that team is still good enough to be right in the middle fifth to seventh seed without Kawhi this year because you you got you just got rid of CJ and you added like Snell and a bunch of role players. You have a Macklemore for a shooter. You have Ant hopefully developing. You have mm-hmm. Nas taking a step up. Um, he would get massive amounts of playing time um, to to develop, and I think that would be good for him. 
Um, so he could be like our Terrence man um, in the playoffs next year. So uh, I think that team is good enough to hang in the playoff race. Um, we don't know when Kawhi would be back. Uh, so Chance who knows? Could be that. back before the end of next season. Yeah. So there could be several months, uh, at least two months before the end of the season, where he gets to play with the team or whatever. Um, and you need a guy like that who can just come in. I mean, he he's load managed in the past. The Raptors year, I think he, I want to say he missed like twenty to thirty games, and um, he was there for them in the playoffs. And uh, I I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a risk, but that's what these people want him to do is take a huge risk, right? And mm-hmm. that would be a huge risk. And the the ceiling for that risk is higher than <laughs> any other move they could make, right? Yeah. So, so like, yeah. I would say to anyone who is against that, like, then you better be for keeping CJ because if, if he trades CJ for Kawhi Leonard – and you're saying you're wasting Dame's prime and he's going to request a trade. Like, that's crazy talk, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, yeah. A lineup of, I don't know, like, if we could get a Paul Millsap as a backup for, a lineup of Dame, Norm, Kawhi, Rocco, Nurkic, and then a bench of Simons, Little, Millsap, and Zeller. That is, in my opinion, obviously when healthy, the best rotation in the entire NBA. That's the ceiling of that team, is you are the best rotation in the entire NBA. I know that Brooklyn has the big three with Kyrie, Harden, and Durant. Kyrie's injury-prone, Durant's, like, starting to become a little injury-prone. Obviously, Kawhi is as well. But, I mean, none of those guys are like like an elite, elite defender. Mm -hmm. They don't really have the quality of role players that we do. Like... Your return on investment when you're just getting, like, scores as superstars, like, goes down the more you add. Like, as a number three, I don't know. Like, Kyrie's great and all, but, like, I'd rather have a lesser number three, but, like, a guy who plays better defense and plays off the ball better and then, like, have a better number four. And our number four in Nurkic in that rotation is better than any of theirs. Mm-hmm. Now, our number five in Roko in that rotation is better than any of theirs at least a better fit so that's the thing like i think that's the best rotation in the league when healthy so you absolutely try and do that and i'm not sitting here thinking it's going to happen because every time i bring it up people are like you really think that would happen you guys are crazy yeah like i already said it is a it is the long shot of all long shots okay but i mean you do have some you do have three people that you could maybe try and use to recruit Kawhi. so it's sort of a situation where I'm not, I don't see why not, why not try and hope. Yep. And with Zach leaving and with Norm's contract, the way it was structured and for being less than we, we thought it was, it does still leave open the possibility of, of a, of a trade like that. So it's still possible. I mean, I don't know how likely it is and we wouldn't have to give up more than CJ and DJ in my opinion. It would be a case of Kawhi could just tell them, either you do this or I'm leaving and I'm just going to go sign with them for the minimum or whatever, you know, mid-level exception. Uh, so you can either take CJ or you can take nothing. Uh, so I I think at that point the Clippers would take what they could get for him. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's unlikely that Kawhi would choose to do that. Um, he's most likely going back. But the other thing is... Uh, Kawhi's not going to allow the team he signs with. So, like, if he did that, he wouldn't allow us to have control over his contract, right? It would be player option, right? Yeah. So he has to sign a three-year contract and assign a trade. And only the last year could be a player option. If we had the team control, it could be two non-guaranteed years. But if it's a player option, it could only be the last year. So he would be stuck here for two years. So not only would we have him for sure... Uh, maybe for, well, not for sure, but hopefully for the playoffs next year. But he would be under contract here the following season as well, and have a player option for that third year because that's the minimum you can sign a uh, a sign and trade free agent for. Yep, yep. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll see. I expect him to go back to the Clippers one like almost a one hundred percent, but. Have to try. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, like, everything this whole offseason just comes back to Siakam for me. Yeah. And well, the Raptors re-signed or extended Masai Ujiri, which I know was kind of like a hold-up in some things. I don't know if that Ujiri getting brought back, I don't know how that's going to potentially affect the Siakam trade. Mm-hmm. But maybe they were waiting on that? I don't know. You then also have the report that... What was the Reese thing this morning, Eric? You want to uh, tell Chad about that? <laughs> yeah, so J. Cal Fisher, who's become somehow like the go-to guy for rumors <laughs> this offseason, yeah. um, is uh, he was on one of those stupid spaces or I don't know, whatever that <laughs> I, it might not have been spaces, but something like that, you know, where people could mm-hmm. request to ask him a question or whatever. Mm-hmm. And our very own Reese asked him because he had mentioned something about the talks between Toronto and Portland, um, like fading or something like that. And, uh, green room, I guess is what it was. Um, and, uh, so Reese asked him to expand on it, and basically he said that Toronto felt like they were overvaluing CJ in the trade, and uh, that's why it didn't get done. This yeah, was before we, the draft. Which is also what I heard, but then I heard that they were talking after the draft, too. Like, they mm-hmm. had a conversation after the draft. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't know. Which Jake right? L. Fisher also reported about that, too. So Yeah, so it's like... Yeah. Um, I mean, what, did they have the same exact conversation for a second time? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that's why I'm not tripping about that. Is like, (laughs) of course, you're going to start out by valuing CJ high. You don't want to, like, have you, have, okay, chat, have you guys ever watched, like, Pawn Stars or something? Have you ever watched a pawn show? Okay? You do not lead with your best offer. You lead with a high offer, and then you come down and meet him in the middle. It's basic negotiation tactics. So him starting off valuing CJ high isn't something to freak out about. Okay? If it comes out at the end, if Siakam gets traded for pennies to Sacramento, then yeah, be mad. If it comes out that Olshay wanted to pick back with Siakam for CJ and wouldn't budge, then yeah, be mad. Like, but unless that's the case, I'm not going to get worked up over something like that. Well... This is why we've always said it probably has to be a three-team trade for Siakam. Because even if they do want CJ as part of the trade, they're not going to value him as much as other teams like a Boston or a New York or a Philadelphia could possibly value him, right? So that's the problem. They're looking at it like, well, we don't really need CJ because we have Trent and Van Vliet still, right? Um, So they're not they're not like us where we kind of need Siakam or whatever to out of this trade. So they're looking at it like, well, why should we just like all of a sudden give him way more value than we think we have him for our team. So I absolutely think, I mean, you actually said you had a source on this back um, when those talks first came out that they wanted Nurkic and it still makes sense for them to want Nurkic. Uh, they let did go. I, huh? I don't remember. Did I? I don't remember, honestly. I Well, you... Did I say that? You had that crazy trade. Like, somehow it was like Nurkic oh, yeah. and CJ for number four in Siakam. Yeah, and there was a bunch like, of other pieces. And, like, it didn't make any sense at all. But Yeah, but, like, Jason Quick was also saying the Blazers turned down the top four pick for yeah. CJ, which I don't know if I believe. I don't... Actually, I lean towards not believing that, but yeah. I also heard the same thing, so, yeah. So, it's not just a case of them... I mean, yeah, that might be that we are under or overvaluing CJ, but that could also mean, like, they're valuing him in a situation where they need, like, Nurkic and picks and other things back. Um, so, uh, yeah. It's just a case of we don't know what they were asking for other than CJ. Because I guarantee you if it was CJ for Siakam straight up, this trade would have already happened. So we just don't Mm -hmm. know how much other stuff is involved here. Yeah. Sorry, I just got distracted. (laughs) 
Um, yeah, we, I mean, there's so much stuff we don't know. Like, But Siakam hasn't been traded yet either, and from all accounts, uh, the relationship between Nurse and Siakam has gone downhill, and they don't think they want to bring him back. So, I mean, until he gets traded to another team, you hear this crap about Sacramento. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. If I was Sacramento, I would... Eh, I don't know. I would think about offering Deer and Fox for Siakam and maybe try and get a pick. Because I think That's long-term, good. Halliburton is best as their starting point guard. Mm-hmm. And, it like, long-term, like, Siakam's so long enough, like, long-term, if you have... Who'd they take number nine again? Davion Mitchell. They yeah. also have Davion Mitchell. Yeah. So Davi- Honestly, like long term, maybe like Davion Mitchell and Tyrese Halliburton is the backcourt there. And then if you have Siakam at the four, you still have Rashawn Holmes. Like if you can maybe suck for another year and get a really good three in the draft, I could see that being a team that like long term could be interesting. I don't know. But like outside De'Aaron Fox is like, I don't, I don't know. Like I don't see him. They shouldn't trade Tyrese for him. I value Halliburton as high as I value Fox. Maybe a little higher. Like, Did you see what Fox did the last 30 games of the season, though? What? He averaged almost like 30 points on really good splits and playmaking and defense. <laughs> this yeah. is you telling me this when you've been lower on him than me. This is backwards. I'm, well, I just... I think that's <laughs> no, I know. Siakam. Yeah, I wouldn't... Yeah, like... I, would, you'd need I don't think Siakam back. makes sense for... For Sacramento, I would. If I was trading for Fox, I would go for someone. Like, yeah, I don't know. Defensively, that team could be insane if you have Davion Mitchell, Halliburton, and Siakam. Yeah. Like long term, like you just need enough offense to be able to compete, and it, like if Davion Mitchell be, can become like a fringe All Star, and Halliburton can, can become a fringe All Star, you need another piece there. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. Is you need like an All Star three. Yeah. But like that could be a contender. I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing there, but I mean, like other than Fox, what package are they? Other than Fox and Halliburton, they don't really have the means to go out and get Siakam. Yeah. If we're offering what we should, which is Max, CJ, and two firsts. Like, I don't think they touched that package. Like, yeah. Bagley doesn't have a ton of value. What else are they going to trade? A bunch of future firsts. The thing is, they're probably going to be a playoff team if they just add Siakam for, like, a Harrison Barnes. Yeah. In my opinion. I mean, they have uh, Shield, I guess. That could have some value to some uh, teams, but not probably like, not probably Toronto. Like 22 mil- yeah, not Toronto. So, here's the thing. If I'm Toronto, like, I'm not necessarily refusing to take back CJ McCollum because we've seen what CJ McCollum has done when he's like the number one guy without Dame. I may be bringing him in and trying to get like additional assets on top of him. And then instead of flipping him, I'm trying to maximize his trade value for a deadline trade and I'm bringing him in and he's the number one guy on the team. And you're bringing him in hoping he can put up 28 and six or something like that and do it efficiently. And then teams are like, oh, he's a legitimate all-star player. He's, you know, a top 20 player in the league or something, which like sounds crazy. But I mean, if CJ's out there putting up an efficient 28 and six at the deadline, he's going to have a lot more trade value than he does now. So if I were them, like that might be a big brain. I feel so bad for Trent. Play. <laughs> I mean, he, his time's coming. You know what I mean? He's getting paid. I don't know, but like, that would be your three guard lineup. You'd have CJ Trent, or you'd have CJ Van Vliet and Trent, and then you try and flip Drogic somewhere else or release him. He only has one year left on his contract or something. I don't know, but like that might be an interesting play, and I could see Ujiri like trying something like that. Because mm-hmm. I mean, you have the defense. Like that team. I don't know, but, like, would they want the team to be that good? Like, the team would probably be, like, a play-in team, mm-hmm. ninth, tenth seed. So, I don't know. Well, that's why it always comes back to me, the Philly, Toronto, <laughs> Portland <laughs> trades, right? Yeah. I don't. It just like... makes too much sense. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't like... Like, I don't like Simmons, but I don't like Simmons as much for Toronto as I did before, A, because he reportedly doesn't want to play there, and B, because they drafted Scotty Barnes. Right. But let's say, I mean, you've come up with trades, right, where they didn't have to give up 
Simmons or Embiid or Harris, right? Mm-hmm. Harris? Uh, Harris. Oh, I thought you said Karis. I was no, like, Harris. Harris. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, like, their big three, they didn't have to give any of those guys up, right? So they could mm-hmm. still trade Simmons to a California team or whatever. But add CJ. So if Toronto was willing to do it, I mean, it could be something like, um, I mean, I'm sure they wouldn't want to give up Curry, and now that Hill's – they waved Hill. It's a little tougher to do, but, um, you know, match salary somehow, uh, or, or do it to where Toronto doesn't have to take back much salary. And, um, somehow Philadelphia ends up with, uh, with CJ Toronto ends up with just a tons of tons of picks because yeah. Philadelphia would give up a couple picks and that we could give up a couple picks. So basically, they Toronto gets like four picks for Siakam instead of CJ and two picks or whatever. And I think that would be better for them. Uh, maybe some expiring contracts or whatever. Um, but yeah, maybe even flip Harris to another team and um, find some sort of value there uh, expirings or something. Mm-hmm. Here's, here's a thought. Like I just had, if Siakam gets traded this off season, Eric, and it's not to Portland, I'm anti Olshay. Mm-hmm. Like, Olshay has to figure out a way to get this done if Siakam is truly available. Like, if Siakam goes back to Toronto, then I'm not going to be anti Olshay. Like, Siakam never even got traded, so either they're asking too much or weren't really trying to trade him in the first place, right? But if Siakam gets traded, unless it's for, like, De'Aaron Fox and two (laughs) first-round picks or something insane that we couldn't have even matched unless we trade Dame, like, that's the only way where Siakam gets traded. Yeah. Where it's somewhere else, and I'm not anti Olshay. Like... He has just you, and, you, if Siakam's available, you gotta figure out a way to go get him. Yeah, and if you're not even trying, oh my goodness, you're. Well, we talked about the difference between like Grant and Siakam, but if we gave up a lot less than it took to get Siakam and we got a Grant, I I'd, I'd be okay with that. I wouldn't be like happy, but at least we did still improve. I think I don't know. Yeah, but it's like you. It's like I feel like you'd have to give up almost as much for Grant as you would for Siakam, and Siakam is like, like you could get better value on a Siakam trade than a Grant trade. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So that's kind of where I sit with that. Yeah. But I mean, we'll see. I'll wake up tomorrow. Like I've been setting alarms. Like after like five, six hours of sleep, like I'm setting an alarm like every forty minutes to an hour to <laughs> repeat, so I can check Twitter. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's bad. Um, I just want this to... I just want this... Like, it was over day one last year. And in 2019, it was, like, over day two. We traded for Whiteside, I think, and pretty mm. much round... Like, our rotation is almost round out, but it's, like, the CJ trade stuff, and then the MLE. Like, it's Friday. We're 22 minutes away from it being Friday. And it started Monday. Like, it's, it's just kind of insane at this mm-hmm. point it's uh I'm, I'm getting worn down because like the the draft stream and the free agency free agency stream see i can't even talk both those streams like took a lot of prep work and whatnot so like normally that all wears me out and then after a couple days of free agency i can relax mm. i can't relax <laughs> i can't relax right now because it's like i know if i get that tweet that we traded cj or that you know, we use our MLE target because I'm going to go live whenever we sign somebody to the MLE. Like, I know I basically just have to be ready no matter what all day for that tweet to come through and stream ASAP. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's wearing on me a little bit at this point. Yeah, I'm going to be gone for a few days too. <laughs> when are you uh, leaving? Uh, I don't want to say the exact dates, but yeah, for, I'm going to be gone for a few days. <laughs> Why? Is somebody going to stalk you? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean like this could drag into that i mean and then i leave like right when you get back so and i won't be able to stream like i'm leaving oh i I guess if you're not gonna say the days i won't say the days i won't miss a thursday monday stream let's just say that um but i mean this could drag into that 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 would be bad if that happened yeah (laughs) like that's my worry no, I'm not going to Hawaii. I mean, I'd have to I'm, get Skype on my phone. I'm going to Sun River. 
summer if it's legit. I'm going to the beach and I'm camping. Nice. So, <laughs> like, I don't have <laughs> the means to stream. I would have to get Skype on my phone. And then you would have to oh, run the yeah. stream. And I'd have to find service and call in. Basically. Ja- Jackson's not paying attention. Yeah. He said he was leaving when I got back. So how is that together? <laughs> uh, anyway, anything else to talk about for for this? No, just uh, yeah. We'll be well, live. Go ahead. So, um, just real quick, to just get nerdy. Um, I need to stop saying that so much. <laughs> I got uh, you saying that. Um, so the, our salary is either about 600,000 less than the tax line. If we have not signed Brown to a contract on the roster, if we do sign him to a minimum contract, we'd be about 366,000 over the tax line. So, um, that means we, we still have a roster spot even if we sign Greg Brown. So for the people saying, oh, we're just going to – we're not using the tax mid-level because we're avoiding the tax, it could be a case where we make a trade to get under the tax line, but it would be impossible to avoid the tax and fill out the 14-man roster. So we are going to be in the tax unless there's a trade. So either they're going to be a tax team or we're making a trade – so to the people who are saying like they're just going to be cheap and not be a tax team, that's impossible to do without a trade, which everyone wants. So it could be a simple trade, like getting rid of Derek Jones for nothing or, uh, you know. Wouldn't CJ and Derek Jones Jr. for Siakam, wouldn't that get us out of the tax? Yes, it would. It would also open up the full mid-level so we could sign two players to that, like I said. but Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, there's ways to improve the roster and stay out of the tax, which would be incredible, incredibly amazing considering everything that has happened. <laughs> um, like, if we could trade CJ for Siakam, basically CJ and Derek Jones Jr. for Siakam and stay out of the tax and, like, say we're able to s- sign Millsap for a cheap enough amount that somehow we're still able to stay out of the tax. I don't know if that's possible or whatnot, but, like... If we were able to do all that and stay out of the tax, cool, save your money. Right. But here's the thing, like... If they barely go into the tax, it doesn't really matter, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, long-term, maybe for repeater, it does. But last year, if we were in the tax, it would have tre- it would have triggered repeater taxes starting this year if we were in the tax, which would have been insane penalties. So, like, it was very important to stay out of the tax last year financially and much more important to stay out of the tax last year than it is to stay out of the tax this year. Yeah. So, the, I don't expect them to really avoid it. The only reason... I think if they were to stay out of the tax. Uh, so you see Golden State, as of right now, I think it's like 180, 190 million just in tax they're going to pay this year. Yeah. Um, Brooklyn's paying 112. So that's like 300 million between two teams. And all the teams that are not in the tax get to split that money. So. <laughs> Ten million dollars. Um, if there's like ten teams in the tax, that's like twenty teams <laughs> with Splitting. just those teams plus all the rest of the teams combined. I think there's some other teams that are like forty, fifty million dollars into the tax. That's a lot of money. <laughs> just a yeah, straight that's check. Like twenty, the twenty-five million maybe for a team. <laughs> right. I mean, so that's the only thing I could think of. But like, if they're that cheap to get a check for twenty million instead of paying out a few million, I hope that's not the case. But. Um, yeah, they can't do it without a trade. So they they have to at least trade Derek Jones and get take back a few million less in salary to make it happen. Or they um, couldn't they wave and stretch Derek Jones and make that technically happen? technically they could, but that's <laughs> I mean very yeah, unlikely. I don't even yeah. like thinking about this. Just yeah. just pay pay the pay the t- if you could get if you can make it work and then get that twenty five million dollar check and you got Siakam on the roster and Millsap yeah. is his backup. Like sure, go ahead. Mm-hmm. But you gotta try and win. Like you're gonna take more than a twenty million dollar hit if Damian Lillard requests a trade. Mm-hmm. So you don't want that. I think, yeah. If we sign Greg Brown to the roster, got Siakam, 
I think we would have about six million between two spots to fill. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, to get to 14. With Siakam injured, I'm, I'm hesitant to only have 14, but maybe they have to. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, you could sign, it's like basically 1.7 million for the minimum contract. So you would have, what, 4.3 or so to just rough math to offer Siakam, and, or not Siakam, uh, Millsap or whatever other free agent you wanted to, and then sign one other minimum contract. Yeah. And stay under the tax, but I don't know if uh, it's worth it. I mean, like I said, at that point, you could use your full mid-level, get two good players possibly for the the cost of one, and then um, at a minute. Just too many numbers for me to even uh, think about at this point. Um, I think Beav is telling Kirk to shut up. Uh, Cody Zeller, Ben McElmore, Tony Snow, not one winning player. See, this is the type of stuff we see. Nobody would have said Bobby Portis was a winning player before this year. Uh, never played in the playoffs, and he was pretty crucial uh, for for Milwaukee. I'm not saying any of those guys are winning players, but you need, you need solid role players. You need insurance guys, and Cody Zeller is a solid backup center. He's one of the better backup centers in the league, in my opinion. So, um yeah, that, that, that stuff is just ridiculous. But he's one of those, should blow it up, guys. So, yeah, anyway. Um, watch this video. Uh, we're wrapping up the stream. So if you want to watch that video I dropped earlier, there's the link for it. Uh, we will be streaming again whenever the Blazers do something. Or we'll be streaming again Monday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hopefully we're streaming again before Monday, Eric. <laughs> That'd be nice. Yeah, fingers crossed fingers crossed anyway uh anything anything left that you want to get off your chest no it's been a fun stream to kind of vent and just hash things out and uh i appreciate Mm -hmm. everyone who tuned in even those of you who have been kind of disrespectful but it's all good more disrespectful people in this stream than we did the draft stream or the free agency stream which is kind of weird weird. um but yeah we got still got 320 people in here 138 likes so hit that like button on the way out that would mean the world to us oh we Uh, missed a donor Uh, oh yeah we gotta thank dro yeah yeah, shout out dro uh nikola kalinich sounds good right now i mean as a third string power forward i'm down with that um that was the that was a guy i signed on a minimum in in the mock off season but i also traded for siakam so you know for all the people about to say oh you guys just love scrubs i made that siakam trade in our mock off (laughs) so anyway uh appreciate you guys joining us tonight and the support that you always give us or at least most of you we will be live hopefully this weekend whenever the blazers have something go down um with that that's a wrap for this one we will see you later hope you have a good rest of your night until next time whenever that is as always peace out go blazers